uh, catch up with you. I love Church Eat Church. Can I call it that? Is that okay? <laughs> I love that. Um, overseas in Italy and Greece, where I'm at with congregations there, they don't do two services, just so you know. They come together, like, for example, in Athens, Greece, it's probably 17 different nationalities, and when they come together, they just stay together. Some of them have come from a train or a bus, and it's taken an hour or two, and they don't have the ease of locomotion that we have. So when they come together, they stay together, and uh, they, don't, they don't do two services. They do one, and they normally always share a meal uh, together. So I love Church Eat Church. Um, it does leave the speaker in a predicament, especially if you're visiting. Um, you know, uh, so the lesson during the worship hour, you know, what am I supposed to do? I'm the only thing standing between you and food. I mean, you, you realize what kind of pressure that puts you under. And uh, in this afternoon one, my Italian brethren taught me that this hour is made for digestion. What are we doing? I'm trying to keep you awake while you're digesting. <laughs> wow, that's a tall order. So, uh, uh, you know, they didn't tell me how much time to, to take, but when your eyelids start cl closing, that's when I stop. That's when I quit. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. Um, Hunter and I spent three months in Europe, study abroad back a lifetime ago, uh, 2015, right? Okay. And I met uh, his wife now, Jenny, and um, I'm just elated that they remembered. Uh, and uh, I'm, I know part of the Kaiser family from uh, the Fried Hartman years. I taught there for seven years in the Bible department. But I have to say that um, uh, the uh, most um, uh, treasured presence today, sorry for forgiving all the rest of you, are my daughter and her husband that came from Hoover with my five, six grandchildren, excuse me, that are here. So please excuse me as I highlight them over there. I'm very grateful. I have 15 by God's, by God's will, and uh, they are all a blessing. And I remember their names, and no, I can't remember their birth dates. That's my job, my wife's job. <laughs> but but I am, we are so blessed, and I am blessed to be with you. So from the life of Paul, lesson number three, and... Uh, it's entitled, Final Instructions Before uh, Departure. Um, that image that you see there is of two men with a beard in the cemeteries of Rome. They're called catacombs from the word ad catacumbas, which means uh, down hollows. They're nearly 40 miles of underground corridors where brothers and sisters of Christ of yours, and they lived in the capital of Rome between the second century and the fourth, buried their dead. You see, the pagans buried their dead above ground. They usually incinerated them, put in barns. But uh, the Christians in the capital of Rome, which will grow to be a massive community, will prefer not to incinerate. The Bible doesn't say whichever way you have to do it, you can choose. But they preferred to not do it like the pagans, bury the whole body, which meant they needed space and land above was very expensive. So they, they simply started using professional diggers to make these tunnels underground so they could bury brothers and sisters in Christ, leaders in the church, grandmas, grandpas, sons, daughters, husbands in a cemetery together. And what's interesting about that is that the word cemetery comes from the Latin word, Roman word, cemeterium, which means dormitory. What is it that we believe? The death is just a what? And there's going to be a giant alarm clock at the end, right? Yes, the answer is yes. The cemetery is just a sleeping place. And by the way, that's what tombs are. They're called locally, which means beds, because we're just sleeping. And... We welcome the second return of Christ, right? Amen? Amen? One of the greetings of early Christians was, may he come soon. Do you think they meant it? Do we mean it? May he come soon. Early Christians in the catacombs did not put images. We have no clue what Paul, Peter, Mary, Joseph, Jesus, or anybody else in apostolic times looked like. None. And Paul, in 13 letters of his, never mentions his looks, except in one verse, Corinthians, to say, I wasn't good looking, so he wouldn't have made the cover of GQ or any fashion magazine. And he even says, I wasn't a very good speaker. You wouldn't have booked me for your next Victory Sunday. You wouldn't have booked me. 
That's amazing. Um, I'm not the best speaker, and I'm not good looking. Don't know what he looked like. These are attempts by 5th century Christians to, um, in, the, in the tombs that possibly um, had at one point the remains of the apostles Peter and Paul. There they are. Peter and Paul will be the most uh, celebrated of the apostles in that area of the world in the centuries to come. And when they start building church buildings, when Christianity was legalized in the 4th century after the Emperor Constantine, they start naming churches in the name of Peter and Paul. So you'll find many ruins or churches, church buildings. Basilicas is the term of the early church that are named after after them. Let's go back to one of the final moments of the Apostle Paul. He was born around the first decade AD. He was converted to Christ around 34. He was in an apartment in Rome, rented a house waiting for his first trial. Uh, under the Roman Emperor in the year 61. And he wrote Philippians and Colossians and Ephesians and the letter Philemon. But then he, uh, he uh, was released. At least that's the best that we can say. And he will travel some more and then he will write some letters. We call them pastorals today. Uh, pastorals meaning the letters of like a, a shepherd to his, his, his sheep. Uh, Paul did not have family or children, but he had two young men in particular that he trained because he never knew when he would be called home. And so he trained Timothy and Titus. Timothy traveled with them extensively, at least uh, for 15 years, from the time Paul picked him up in Lystra in Asia Minor, and then Timothy. And he will send them out. He will, in his later life, send them to, to Crete, to the island of Crete, and to the city of Ephesus and the congregation there. And he will have them do the work for him. So we're going to just go in in our lesson this afternoon, uh, catch a few glimpses from the last letters of Paul before he died. Um, it's called the letter of 2 Timothy. We know it's the last letters. Final words before departure. That's what 2 Timothy is. We have those words. So let me begin a short list to make you, get you thinking about that. It's very peculiar, uh, some what, what some people say when they're on their deathbed, when they know they're going to die the next minute, the next day. Okay, in 1786, on the 4th of July, both the second and the third U.S. president, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, these are the last words before they died. Is it the fourth? Uh, I guess I might not say anything meaningful on my last, <laughs> but it's kind of peculiar that that's what they would ask. It's very strange that you go back uh, a century before, Napoleon Bonaparte, a French uh, military leader and uh, emperor, uh, his uh, sister, Alicia, she said, nothing is certain as death. Have you heard these words? They're still saying them 20 centuries later. And people around her thought she was dead until she added what? You ever heard this one? Nothing's uncertain except taxes, death and taxes. <laughs> she said it. Final last words. What? The... the the sister of the emperor was worried about taxes? Wow, where does that leave us and the IRS? W.C. Fields, he was a comedian. I still don't get this one. Maybe you do. He said his famous last words before he died was, on the whole, I'd rather be in Philadelphia. What on earth does that mean? And am I supposed to laugh or what? I really honestly don't know. The wife of a great military leader, Greek, fourth century before Christ, Alexander the Great, he asked, who is going to rule? She asked her husband, oh, I was about to die. He died at the age of 33, but fever, uh, in, a, in a somewhere far away from land, homeland. And she said, who's going to take your place? He had a lot of uh, buddies that had homeschooled with him in his, in his palace of Pella back in Macedonia. And she was saying, who's going to be the guy to take over for you? And he simply said, the strongest, which left her going, once again, you didn't answer the question. <laughs> Who's the strongest? That's, that's what husbands do to wives. They puzzle them. <laughs> Puzzling is Virgil, a great poet. He wrote one of the greatest works of literature, secular works of literature of mankind. Commissioned by the emperor of Rome, Octavian Augustus, he worked. He, I still have to teach it today to you know, poor Faulkner students who don't want to learn what somebody wrote 21 centuries ago, but they're going to, <laughs> okay? And when he was on a deathbed, his last words were, burn it. We still, 20 centuries later, asking, 
Why would you want your masterpiece, your best work, burnt? Why? They didn't, by the way. I teach it. So we have it. But he said, burn it. Is it because he wasn't going to get copyrights out of it or what? You know, why burn your greatest work? You know, it's kind of like saying, you know, Michelangelo in his last final words saying, please splash paint on the Sistine Chapel. I don't want anybody to enjoy it anymore. Uh, you know, why would you do that? Zwingli is uh, one of the Protestant reformers. We're talking 16th century now, and we're talking in the areas of Switzerland today. He was a reformer and contemporary of Martin Luther, who rebelled to, of course, the Catholic Church at the time. And he said some famous words that still do resonate. They can kill my body, and they did. He died in battle with uh, uh, Catholic forces, but they can't kill my soul. And he was right about that. I think somebody said that. Beware of the one who can uh, take your body but not... Uh, but, uh, but take your soul, uh, not your body. William Carey, who was a missionary, Protestant missionary to India, said, when I'm gone, speak not of Dr. Carey and more of Dr. Carey's Savior. Now, these are words that you can take to heart. Good words, very much. And then, of course, the biblical figure of leader of the children of Israel, Joshua, will, will say, uh, choose for yourself. Do you know this one? It's, I have it on one of the signs in my house. Choose this day. Make up your mind. This day whom you will serve as for me in my house. Please, you're welcome into my house. Glad to have you. But please know that this house has chosen long ago to serve God. Okay? Words of a dying man. You can't see it, but an artist has conglomerated here. The seven last sayings of Jesus on the cross. And if you've never done a study of that, I hope you will. It's a fascinating one. We have four Gospels, and embedded in those four Gospels are the, in the seven hours that Jesus was on the cross from about nine in the morning to about four o'clock in the afternoon, about one saying per hour. I don't know when he said them. That's not the point, but there's an interesting parallel of how many we have and how many hours he was on the cross approximately. So you remember them. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Words of a dying man. Truly, truly, I say to you, today I will be, you will be with me in paradise. He said that to one of the thieves. He did not say it to the other thief. Woman, this is your son. This is your mother. The only apostle at the feet of the cross was John. And he takes care of earthly business. He's dying. He's the oldest son. Joseph has long been gone. I don't know when he died, but probably when Jesus was young. And Mary and Joseph had at least four sons and at least two daughters. See Mark chapter 6. Large family. Mary's there. The only apostle that's there at the cross is John. And he says, take care of my mother. And mother, this is now your son who's going to take care of you. And then, of course, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. I don't speak Aramaic, so I may have mispronounced it. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The most darkest, tragic moment all of history, in all of time, the moment when God the Father turns his back on his son on the cross. And God tried to make sure that you and I would understand the insignificance of that by sending earthquakes. People were coming out of tombs in Jerusalem on that day. The 90-foot-high curtain of the temple split in half. And then he, on one more thing, put three hours of darkness in the middle of the day. Are you paying attention to what's being said by a dying man on a cross? You need to. You need to listen. It's my son. God, this is what was required and necessary for your sin and mine. Why have you forsaken me? It's like God's back was turned to his son. God has no back. But I'm using anthropomorphic terms like in the Old Testament. They say, talk about the hands of God or the feet of God. God doesn't have feet and hands. He's spirit. But that said... Since you and I live in human terms in a physical world, it's like the father, a father, turned his back on his only son. Why have you forsaken me? I gave him drink twice, the best I can tell. First time he refused it. He didn't want the alcohol alcoholic content to affect him. Second time he took it because he was done. He says, I thirst. That's a physical declaration of dehydration. Doctors will tell you one of the worst parts of crucifixion is really not when the nails, nails go tearing into right here or go through your bones. They usually use one to maximize. The nails were this big, and they were huge. And they went right through 
the bones of the ankle, and we have one crucifixion from the first century, and the nail is still in both bones of the ankles. That's really not the worst moment of being crucified. It's what happens afterwards, the dehydration. Dehydration is like drowning, like asphyxiating. And it, ha- and it goes on and on and on. And the parchment, parched lips and the cracking of them, that's the worst part. I thirst. Words of a dying man. And then finally, right before he gave his last, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Well, I, I am going to Paul. And so, what are the words of a dying man? Paul... Uh, we'll write the letter of 2 Timothy, which by the inspiration of God is protected from error and was preserved for us. I will remind you that not all of Paul's letters are in our, uh, uh, available to us. There are at least probably four letters of Corinthians. He had to write that congregation a lot. They had a lot of problems, um, a lot of issues. And with heart broken, he wrote them many times. We have two. What we call first is probably second. What we have second is probably fourth. But that said, just a reminder to you, we have what we need. We have 13 letters of his, by all accounts, and we have the last. We have the last words that he dictated. Not from a nice rented house anymore, but from a prison cell. The last letter of Paul. We cannot be totally sure of the movements of Paul between the letter of Philippians that we studied earlier in our lesson and this letter right here. We cannot be sure of that. So I can give you some, just some hints and suggestions. Here are some hints we can get about what happened to Paul between the year 61 and the year 64, or maybe, dare I say, 65. In the letter of Romans, he will say, I would really like to go to Spain. And he's not talking tourism here. What he's talking about is he has gone from Jerusalem all the way to Athens, Greece, and now he's in Rome, and further past that westward is what we call the Iberian Peninsula, or what you call the country of Spain. The countries didn't exist back then. It was all owned by the Roman legions. But he wanted to go to Spain. He wanted to go as far as the Mediterranean world would take him. Eighty million people lived in the Mediterranean world. Six million of them were Jews, and they were spread out all over in the dispersion. But about 74 million or more were pagans, and they worshipped man-made gods, and they were lost And by the way, so were his Jewish brothers. They were lost because they were waiting for the Messiah, his Jewish brothers in the synagogues, and that's why he went to synagogues to tell them, I've got the missing piece for the puzzle. It's the Messiah. It's Jesus of Nazareth. He came. Your leaders rejected him. That's what he preached in synagogues. And then he went to the Gentiles who were in the back pews of the synagogues, and he preached to the pagans and said, I am here to tell you that God cares about You too. You're not second-class human beings, second-class citizens in the world. Jesus, the construction guy from Nazareth, died for you too. And I'm here to tell you that. Romans says, I want to go to Spain. Paul means by that is, I want to, you know, if God allows me to, I want to go as far west in the Mediterranean Sea as I can. He didn't have trains and planes and cars. Yet he had a vision of the world. How many stamps did he have in his passport? You know, I take people and study abroad, and three-fourths of them don't have passports yet. So you got to get one if you're going to get on the, on the road. I've had several in my life. You know, when you finish a passport, by the way, they punch a hole through it so you can't use it anymore, but it's a memory of all the, the places you've been. Check out Paul's passport. <laughs> He's been to more places than you have, and you have trains and planes and cars. He had a vision of going. I mean, you can stay right here in Leeds and, and evangelize. No problem. You need to. Somebody needs to. But somebody's got to go too. <laughs> Somebody's got to get a passport. And he figured he's the one because he wasn't married. You know, Peter has a wife. And others do too. They will travel too. But uh, why does Luke focus on the missionary journeys of Paul? Because He matters more because he's the best? No, because he um, exemplifies the kind of excitement about the gospel and what we have in Christ that just is amazing. Paul will say in 1 Timothy, um, uh, I'll, I'll be in Macedonia later. Wow, he's writing from somewhere else in the Mediterranean. Man, how do you travel, Paul? Foot, donkeys, ships. Now ask him, do you like traveling on ships? I'll have to... 
secure this when I get to heaven, but I don't think he liked it. I think he probably, like me and you, was afraid of, you know, uh, seasickness. Have you ever been on the high seas? Have you ever seen 30-foot waves in the middle Mediterranean on a... I've been across the Atlantic one time. I love playing table tennis on a boat that's in the middle of a storm. You should try that. So it's like three-dimensional ping pong, you know. The boat's moving this way and this way. So the table, which is attached to the boat, is doing that. And the ball's in the air. That's so cool. Unless you suffer seasickness. Paul, do you, uh, you don't happen to be seasick. I don't think they had drama mean in the first century. But um, I don't think he liked uh, to sail. But the only way to get from here to there is on a ship. So whether I like it or not, I've flown planes since I was six. I don't always like airports. I don't like airports anymore. All that security stuff, I don't like it. And I, you know, there are tense moments and there are, and, you know, planes, you know, they say they're safer than cars. My experience is they are, uh, especially when I see how people drive around Mo- Montgomery. I think the planes are safer than cars. That said, uh, you want to go to Macedonia. How are you going to get there from where you're at? Wow, Paul has this thing, you know. Paul visited the island of Crete. Uh, that's in Titus. He writes to Titus in his pastoral letter to him because Titus had been left there in the island of Crete, largest island in the middle of the Mediterranean. And Paul says, I'm going to come see you. Wow, you're going to have to get on a boat to get to that one. <gasps> a big boat. Because <laughs> sh- the coast huggers won't get you to Crete. Crete, you, gotta, mm, you can't travel between February and October in the no sailing season between uh, October and, and January, February. Don't sail. If you want a lesson on that, read Acts chapter 28, 27 and 28, which is the most spectacular shipwreck ever <laughs> in the life of Paul. He was in three of them, by the way. 286 people were kept alive by the will of God through the most spectacular, spectacular shipwreck. He, he says to Timothy, I'll meet you in Nicopolis. Where on earth is Nicopolis? Well, it's on that coast of Greece. Good grief. That's way over there on Epirus. He will uh, be uh, at a port along what we call the Turkish coast today in ancient Asia Minor, Miletus. And he left there Trophimus sick. We know he was in Troas. And some scholars even think that he was arrested in Troas and taken back to Rome for his second Roman imprisonment in the year 64. Or he was arrested in Rome when he got there the second time after a release. Either way, it is. These are kind of hints of what happened to him. We have some uh, uninspired sources that kind of hint at Paul's travels. Clement to Rome, a church father from about 30 years after he was killed, in one of his non-inspired letters says that he preached to the limits of the West. Well, in the Roman Empire, the limits of the West was Spain. In a collection of inspired works called the Moratorian Canon that comes from the end of the second century, uh, there's a reference to Paul's departure from the city as he was proceeding to Spain, once again saying you need to look to his travels to the west. You will not find anything detailed in Acts because Acts stops in the year 62, and this is 64 or 65. Church father named Eusebius, he's the first church historian of the, of the church in the early 4th century in his ecclesiastical histories, cites a tradition of that Paul was released from Rome in 62, and then he was rearrested about two years later, and it was a martyrdom. So if you were to look at a map, it would look something like that. Whoop, like this. Look at this. Well, you can't see it, but uh, from Rome, in his first imprisonment, this dotted line goes over to to uh, Spain. So it's a dotted line. We're not sure of it. But then he came back towards the east. And then you see all that, those arrows. And those we can be sure of because they're in the letters of Paul. Miletus and uh, the, the city of Nicopolis and uh, uh, Ephesus and all those places where he went. I'm simply trying to trace his last uh, journeys before he sits down in a prison in Rome to write his final words. We have uh, some ruins from Nicopolis. This is where he met. He said, I'll meet you uh, in, uh, in the spring, he says to Timothy. Uh, t- that's where Nicopolis is in the map. And these are ruins of an aqueduct and a, and a gym that d- uh, derived from that city in the time of Paul at that time. Um, so when he writes Second Timothy, where is he? It's about the year 64. He's in Rome at the writing. He's awaiting execution. So there's been a trial or something. There's no, he doesn't wonder anymore. It's not like in Philippians. If 
uh, if I live, it's to serve Christ. If I die, it's gain. There's no doubt now. The button's been pushed. What has happened? You know, um, uh, I'll go ahead and mention it for sake of time, but there has been a, a, a terrible disaster. There's been a fire. You see, Rome with two million had a lot of marble and, and stone, and, but it also had shantytown. It had poor people. It had unemployment, too. In fact, that's how the Roman emperors took care of unemployed. They would give them free food and, at, the, at the games and free entrance to the games. That would call panem et circenses, which means bread and circuses. They gave them welfare to remind them they didn't have a job. All these people came to Rome to get a job, to live the good life, and there wasn't enough work there, so they were, were there. Um, he is in the uh, city of Rome uh, after a gigantic disaster. Somebody maybe was cooking a, a bowl of pork and beans, I don't know, in Shantytown, Rome, and it spilled. And a fire in, in the lower parts of Rome, the part that Emperor Nero always criticized from his balcony of his beautiful palace by the Colosseum called the Golden Palace Domus Hauda. Uh, I hate that part of Rome. Ugly, ugly houses, ugly neighborhoods, and it burned, all of it. It was a disaster. Thousands of people. Rumors started that he had said it, the emperor himself, but he wasn't even there. He was down in Naples, but he had to do something for all these people without, not only jobs now, without homes as well. And we got to find the guilty party. Let's find someone to blame for the fire. So the Roman historian Tacitus will tell you that em Emperor Nero had an idea. This 23-year-old, oh, now he's 25. Let's blame the followers of Crestus, Crestus being Christ. He knew about the Christians. Paul had come up before him two years before. He knew about the Christians. He knew that they were a growing number. There was a church of Rome. There are four churches in Rome today of our fellowship. There was a church there. Been there ever, ever since the day of Pentecost, probably. Paul didn't start the church in Rome. He wrote a letter to him called Romans. That was about 10 years before. But Paul was again in Rome, and this time he was arrested, and he was going to be executed. If the uh, martyrologies are correct, and again, we don't have this from Scripture, about a 1,000 of your brothers and sisters in Christ were killed, innocent people. And using the words of the Roman historian to the brutality of the Roman emperor, and the Roman historian Tacitus, who doesn't like Christians, he feels sorry for them. And by the way, caught up in the arrests of a thousand people were some of the leaders, including Peter and Paul, who were in Rome at that particular time. So I'm going to just drop into uh, the letter of Second Timothy. Final words of a dying man. Just a few glimpses, and then let the lesson be yours. May I advise... It's short that you read the rest tonight before you lay your head on a pillow. Paul, dictating from a, a dark dungeon, writes these final words before his death. He, he writes to Timothy, As I remember your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord let me bring the text up for you. Sorry, I forgot. Nor of me, his prisoner, but share in suffering for the gospel by the power of God. I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and I am convinced that he is able to guard until the day what has been entrusted to me. I'm just going to drop into a spot or two in the four chapters, and then the lesson is yours. Tears and joy. I miss you. There's the human side. I'm not going to get to see you again. Hurry. I'd love to see you again before I, I'm executed. But there's joy, too. I will be so happy if you get here before I'm executed. Tears and joy. This life is made of both. You know, one of the things attractive about heaven is there will be no what? No tears. Book of Revelation. No reason for tears anymore. No reason. I am a prisoner now. He's used that word in two senses all his life. A voluntary prisoner or slave of Jesus. I'm a voluntary. Nobody made me do that. And I'm a prisoner now of the Roman authorities, of the powers that be. And they may kill me or not. It's in God's hands. It's not in the emperor's hands. 
I will remind you that in Acts chapter 12, James is the first apostle killed by Herodian vicious king who executes him by beheading him. And he's going to do that to Peter the next day. And God says, I don't think so. And Peter is led out of a prison cell. So God is in charge. He allows things to happen. All men that use their authority and power viciously are going to give account to God. All. How politicians and presidents and emperors, they're going to give account to God. I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed of being in trouble with the law because I know who I am and I know whom I have believed. We have a hymn that takes those words and enshrines them in beautiful music. I know who I have believed. Do you know who you've believed in? Enough to die. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. To the point of death says, is your faith strong enough to endure the kind of uh, test that early Christians stood? You know, persecution of Christianity will start right here in Rome. Jews persecuted Christians up till 65. Now it's going to be Romans from 65 on. The Romans weren't against Christianity until this moment. But you will have to wait till the year 313 before Christianity is legalized. From 65 AD till 313, two and a half centuries, some of the worst persecutions at the end of the third century. How would we pass that test? How strong is our faith, I guess, is the question. I know whom I have believed. For you are aware of all who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. May the Lord grant mercy to the household on Isiphorus, for he often refreshed me, and I was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he searched for me earnestly and found me. Some other things about the context of Second Timothy. There have been some Christians in Asia that kind of do, well, the kind of, you know, Sunday Christians. You know, if push comes to shove, you start paying a price, being a Christian becomes expensive. Ah, uh, that's not what I signed on. You know, one of the amazing things of Matthew chapter 10 is before Jesus basically uh, enlists the apostles in training to fully do what they're supposed to do, he says, look, here's the contract. There, people are not going to like you. Powers are going to turn against you. You're going to be persecuted in my name. You sure you want to sign this contract? They're going to treat you like they treated me, like they're treating me, what he says to the apostles. If they rejected me, they're going to reject you. They're going to throw you in prison. Jesus says it to the apostles. Make sure you read the contract because Christianity has the promise of a home in heaven, but we have... We have an enemy that we face every day we get up and there's a battle and we're in a battlefield, good against evil, and we are the only plan that God's had. We are on God's side. We have already won. We're victorious in Christ, Romans chapter 8. We are winners if we stay faithful. But there's a battle and Satan wants to bring as many down as he can. It was true in the first century. It's true today. People leave the church. There it is. All who are in Asia turned away from me. You know, when I got in trouble with Roman authorities, maybe that's why he was arrested in Troas. Um, there's a bunch of people that quit. Quit. He says, however, let me recommend to you Onesiphorus because, man, he was so encouraging to me. I can't wait to meet Onesiphorus. And when he arrived in Rome, the biggest city in the world, he had to look for me. Where is Paul? <laughs> Once again, find his address if you can. He's in a prison cell this time. And that's what then. You then, my child, be strengthened, he says to Timothy. He is a son in the faith. He doesn't have physical sons. He has sons in the faith. By the grace that is in Christ Jesus, what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, and trust to the faithful men who will be able to teach others also. What he says is, you've been with me for 12 years. Uh, Paul was not perfect. Timothy knew Paul's imperfections. If anybody did. But Paul says, stick to my teachings because um, I have taught you what you need to know. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome. Final instructions. It's kind of like a father or mother sending their kid off to college. I've seen this often. You know, they're leaving home. And so you give them these final instructions. One of the most peculiar scenes is in Shakespeare. It's one of the great tragedies called uh, Hamlet. And there's a father of this 
uh, 13th century fictional character sending his son off to college in Germany. <laughs> and he tells him stuff like this, you know, uh, don't, don't flaunt your, your car and your money, uh, be, be, you know, sober minded, uh, be serious about what you do. Look what Paul says to uh, Timothy, be kind, be nice to everyone. You need to practice being able to teach. You're going to have to endure evil because it's going to be all around you. It's going to be there. You need to correct your opponents, but with gentleness. Speak the truth in what? Love. God may perhaps grant them repentance. Say, please remember, as stubborn and obstinate and anti-Christianity as people may be, God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses uh, and grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. By the way, Paul did not believe the devil was just a cute little figure in a red suit, uh, for sure. Finishing up, understand this, he says, chapter 3. In the last days, there will come some times of difficulty. People will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, Disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having appearance of godliness but denying its power. Avoid such people. Here's a question. Is he making a list of the kind of people that live in the first century Roman Empire? Yes. Is he making a list of the kind of people we live around to? Tragically. Tragically. Scripture is always relevant. Always. Finishing up. Come soon. Do your best to come to me soon, he says to Timothy. Demas left. He abandoned me. He's in love with the present world. He has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia. He's not deserting me, but he's not here in Rome either. And then he begins a list of people that were there in Rome around him and that he's missing. Titus is in Dalmatia. Luke, the writer of the book of Acts, is, is, is the only one with me now here in Rome. So get Mark. That would be the writer of the Gospel of Mark, cousin of Barnabas, and bring him with you. I, he is useful to my ministry. He's still thinking his ministry, even though he may, may be executed next week. Tychicus, he's the postman of all his letters, I have sent to Ephesus. When you come, bring the cloak. I'm cold. There's this human side. Watch out. Final instructions, final words before his death. I'm cold. You're reminded there's a human side. He cares about the spiritual more than anything else. I miss my books. And what he meant by books, since they didn't have things with a spine, like he misses his scrolls. Uh, they didn't have a smartphone. Boy, would he have loved to have a smartphone. Alexander the coppersmith did me great harm. He goes back to names of people that Timothy knows that are, the Lord will repay him. Uh, Paul doesn't curse him. What he says is, you know, bad stuff uh, was brought to me by this man, and uh, God is the one who will judge. Um, for I am already being poured out as a drink offering. The time of my departure has come. This is it for me. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Henceforth is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So, hurry, hurry. That sounds like me and you. When we're sick, when we're hurt in the hospital, hurry. And then the final words. This letter Second Timothy closes with, the Lord be with your spirit. Blessing, grace be with you all. If tradition is correct, he was executed uh, at a third mile marker, a post that the Romans used in their roads, on the Ostian Way exiting Rome. We do not have his remains. There's a church in Rome called Church of St. Paul outside the walls that's said to contain the sarcophagus with the remains of Paul. It is a first century remains, but most probably Peter and Paul and the other 900 and something were thrown into mass graves, kind of like the Nazis 
through Jews in their extermination camps in the mass graves. Uh, they didn't put people in individual graves when they killed them, whether they executed them with a sword across the neck or put them on a cross. That was the life of Paul. Uh, final instructions before departure. The Lord be with your spirit. Grace and peace with, be with you. I don't know if you and I will see each other on this side of the sun. But our job is to maintain the faith and stay strong so that the grace of God, the peace that passes understanding, will be ours for eternity and that home in heaven. And I will see you either on this side or on that side, whichever way. There's been an invitation song that's been chosen. And uh, I'm going to just take us to those words because um, if you're not in Christ, uh, it's only a step out of that pew. But uh, it requires everything you are and have. You've got to give it all to God. You've got to give all of yourself to him. Part of it's not going to be okay. I don't know if you can detect it, but I think Paul gave his all. So there's the example, a human example of heroic living out your faith until death calls him. You and I may not be called to execution like he was, and many Christians for the first two and a half centuries were, but we're called to live out our faith in hard times until he either comes back or we're called home. If you're not in Christ, please take that step as we sing together.